This program is funded in part by the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation and In the Life members nationwide. Walking down the aisle, why Hawaii is wed to the idea of gay and lesbian marriage. In his own right, Paul Rudnick, part of a new generation of outriders on stage and screen. War of Independence, how gay filmmakers are revolutionizing American cinema. So get ready for the show that looks at life through a lavender lens. As we bring you... In the... Fight! Welcome again to In the Life, your monthly guide to the best in gay culture and entertainment. I'm Greg Watt. And I'm Katherine Linton. One of the most profound and moving moments in last year's March on Washington was the sight of thousands of couples symbolically taking their wedding vows. Of course, same-sex marriage is not yet legally recognized, but as Chris Montgomery reports, the dream of gay marriage has come one step closer to reality in Hawaii. It all started in May of last year. That's when the Hawaiian Supreme Court, ruling in favor of three gay couples, decreed that not allowing same-sex marriages violated the state's constitution on grounds of gender discrimination. Hawaii, with its extraordinary ethnic and religious diversity, is one of the most progressive states in the union. Everyone here is a minority. There is no majority here in Hawaii. And because of that, the state and the people in the state have been more acceptable of other people, period. In 1990, three same-sex couples put Hawaii's tolerance to the test when they applied for marriage licenses. We grew up realizing that marriage is the next progression. After you find somebody and fall in love with them, that's the next thing you do is get married. I wanted to marry Ninia early on in our relationship. It's unfortunate that, you know, gay people can't do that. They can't just run away and elope. We waited till the political climate and the atmosphere was really correct. Uh, we knew that the state of Hawaii had, had uh, gender neutralized their laws. And the prerequisites for marriage, as they are stated in the Hawaii state statutes, deleted the parts that referred to male and female. <clears throat> and it, it became the word spouse. We began looking at um, health insurance papers, who was going to be the beneficiary, and it was then that I called the Gay Community Center and asked them about domestic partnership laws, and they said, no, there is no domestic partnership in Hawaii, but we think that same-sex couples have the right to get married, and we're looking for test couples. So I said, Janora, guess what? You really can marry me. Ha, ha, ha. The couples applied for their licenses on Monday morning, December 17, 1990, at the Department of Health in Honolulu. Three couples went down to fill out applications for a marriage license, and we were followed by uh, camera crews and newspaper reporters, and there, of course there were other people in there, um, regular heterosexual couples getting marriage licenses at the same time. When we went down to the Department of Health, the woman who actually took our application seemed very relaxed about it, and she was about to give us our license. And then her boss came over and said, oh, I don't think you should do this. And, uh, he took us into a back room and said, well, we're going to have to ask the attorney general. And the press was there, and um, we, you know, we left without our license that day and told them we'd sue them. The three couples brought their case to a lawyer, Dan Foley, a specialist in civil rights cases. Being a civil rights attorney, uh, certainly uh, I was interested in the issue. As a straight male, I'd never thought of it before. Uh, it was the first time it was raised to me. Um, but I, I guess my first personal reaction was, since I'm married, who am I to say they can't marry? In his argument before the Hawaiian Supreme Court, Foley made a logical connection between laws regarding same-sex marriage and interracial marriage. Our court relied on the U.S. Supreme Court case of 1967 that struck down the miscegenation laws because our court found that the logic was the same. Uh, when you prohibit races from marrying one another uh, and you prohibit sexes from marrying one another, 
uh, there's no difference. One is race discrimination, one is sex discrimination. Uh, both are unconstitutional. On May 5th, 1993, the Hawaiian Supreme Court issued its decision. A male and a female walk in and they're not married, they want a license, you give it to them. A male and a male walk in and want a license, you won't give it to them. You are discriminating against them. The celebration began just hours after the High Court's ruling. I just feel great. I feel elated. It's like a, a burden has been taken off my shoulders. It's now up to the state to prove compelling interest for banning same-sex marriages, a difficult legal task. But for the couples involved, the political ramifications are less important than the simple fact of marriage itself. I, I never thought of it as a protest. Some people may think that we're gay activists, but we're not. We're really just two people in love. Historically, the U.S. courts have ordered states to recognize out-of-state marriages, even when they don't adhere to local marriage laws. So, in theory at least, if the Hawaiian court does okay gay marriages, those marriages would have to be recognized in the other 49 states. Another controversy of recent years has been the exclusion of gays and lesbians from the annual New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade. We can march, however, in the parades in Ireland, thanks to the efforts of people like Anne McGuire. She is one of the founding members of the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization and the focus of this month's Global Minute, our series devoted to gay life around the world. The parade is now not an Irish parade. The organizers have defined it as a Catholic parade and have said in public that, um, that it was a victory for Catholics over homosexuals. And that we will never march in their parade. So they've actually turned the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York into a Catholic procession rather than a celebration of being Irish. Growing up in Ireland was very difficult because there were absolutely no role models. I didn't know the word lesbian until I was, you know, um, probably a late teen. Um, when I came out to my family, they were extremely supportive. Um, my brother and sisters were extremely supportive and told me that they had always known and they were just waiting for me to tell them. This year, Stonewall 25 is going to be a huge international event. People who come specifically for this, they're never going to forget it. They're going to go back to wherever they came from, thinking there is a better way. I can, I can be differently, I can be much more out there, I can be really proud. And think about how self-oppressed they are as lesbians and gay men. I think that's, once that question is planted in somebody's head and somebody's heart, it changes their life. Over the last 25 years, writers like Edmund White, Armistead Maupin and Rita Mae Brown have written a bold new chapter in gay literature. But gay screenwriters working in a homophobic Hollywood have been far less successful being heard until now. Alan Tulin reports that a new group of out and proud screenwriters are for the first time projecting our lives onto the silver screen. That's right, Catherine. That group includes Richard Kramer, one of the major creative forces behind 30-something and Tales of the City, also Oscar-nominated Ron Nicewanner, enjoying the hit of his career with Philadelphia, and the fellow we profile today, Paul Rudnick, the funny boy behind such wildly diverse projects as the off-Broadway AIDS comedy Jeffrey and Hollywood's offbeat Adams Family Values. Father, what is it? It's an Adams. When Adams Family Values was released last year, few missed the irony of the title. Not only was the film a celebration of one of America's most beloved families, for openly gay playwright Paul Rudnick, it was a chance to turn the concept of traditional family values on its head. He likes you. <laughs> I'm good with my hands. All of the humor stems from Charles Adams, who was a great Native American genius and who is uh, just a master of the and that sort of black comic tradition and certainly an antidote to the Brady Bunch and the Donna Reed family and everything that's been saccharine and wholesome and sun-kissed in American culture. So it, when, when you start there, it's, it's hard to go very wrong. Um, it certainly is a, a comic tradition that I identify with and was easily swept up in, especially when it came to Wednesday. Life-saving! I'll be the victim. All your life. 
While Adam's Family Values was playing in malls across America, Rudnick was taking New York by storm with Jeffrey, a play about a gay man who is so terrified of AIDS, he decides to give up sex. Okay, good, no sex, no sex. I'm ready, I'm willing. Let's go. When I first was writing Jeffrey and I was wondering, God, will anybody produce this play? Is there any audience for it? Will be, people be horribly offended because it's so sexual, so gay, and above all else, because it's a comedy about AIDS, will there be any place for it? I just decided, I'll worry about that later. Uh, because if I thought about it for a second, it would seem impossible. Rudnick knew people would be shocked to discover a comedy about AIDS. What he didn't know was how willing they would be to find humor in the face of tragedy. The red ribbon I wear stands for AIDS awareness. The lavender ribbon is in memory of those who have died. And the diamond spray is a gift of my first husband. <laughs> There's a range of responses to, to the AIDS crisis, and certainly wild anger and political protest are absolutely crucial. But there is also a real necessity for humor. I think when you spend that much time in hospitals and that much time marching, if you don't have a couple of laughs or more than a couple, you are in big trouble. You're not going to make it. As Jeffrey prepares to open in theaters around the country, Rudnick has begun writing a script for the film version. It's a bold step for a play that deals so openly with gay sex, but one that he thinks the world is ready for. So I just think it'll be fun to see if you can make a gay film that's not politically earnest, that's not a serious, well-intentioned liberal track that no one really wants to see, even gay people. I think it would be fun to see if, uh, if it could just be a party. With such success coming his way, could there be anything Paul Rudnick has to worry about? Well, maybe just one thing. There is a wildly gifted and irresponsible film critic at Premier Magazine called Libby Gelman Waxner. And more than one irresponsible journalist has suggested that Libby and I are one and the same. And she is, you know, a, a gifted, nurturing person who I think has, has brought a whole new perspective to, to American film in that she concentrates almost entirely on hair and clothing and on which film stars she would like to date. I think she, I certainly admire and in fact worship Libby Gelman Waxner, but I would never dream of claiming credit for work of that caliber or that level of dementia. Paul Rudnick's next play, The Naked Truth, opens in New York in May. Meanwhile, the movie version of Jeffrey will be filming in New York this summer. So we've got two great things to look forward to. And now for something we're really glad to report. The recipients of the 1994 Media Awards from the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Each year, GLAAD honors those mainstream films, TV series, newscasts, and specials that present balanced portrayals of lesbians and gay men. Here's a look at this year's winners. Coping with AIDS, moving towards marriage, starting families, and establishing legal rights. In the 90s, these are the issues facing New York's gay community. I'm sorry, that's impossible. We have to protect the confidentiality of our clients. I know, but Eddie, you know that I speak on behalf of the Gay Liberation Committee, the City Council, the State Assembly. I can tell you without fear of contradiction, you are regarded, second only to Abling, as a citizen who would fight to the death to preserve civil liberties. So let's cut the crap. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, for God's sake. Let us in. Selma, only for you. And lo, the prophet was led by his nightly dreams to the hiding place of the sacred implements. And revision in the text, the angel did help him to unearth them, for he was weak of body, though not of will. You crack the refrigerator. You want to label me? Label me. I'm gay. I'm a gay man. Happy? No. How do you know? I'm surprised you even know what a lesbian is. No, a lot more than you think. Oh, yeah. When was the last time you spoke to one? Day before yesterday. Aunt Evelyn. Aunt Evelyn! That your men are worried that they can't trust a gay cop to be there when a cop needs help. But in this case, it was the straight cops who didn't show up. Hi. I want you to stay in the booster club. 
Will we? Stay in the booster club. Do what you have to do. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you coming to the game? Do you want us to? I'll be sitting on the bench. Not for long. <laughs> Gay? Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. I mean, it's fine if that's who you are. Absolutely. I mean, I have many gay friends. My father's gay. Look, I... Well, I didn't raise my kids to sit in the back of the bus. You get in there and you fight for your rights, okay? Earlier, we reported that openly gay writers are now making it in mainstream Hollywood. But as Sheridan Bailey reports, some of the most inventive filmmakers are working outside the system. Philadelphia notwithstanding, the truest portrait of gay men and women have usually been found in independent films. My Own Private Idaho, The Living End, The Wedding Banquet. What will the indies bring us this year? Here's a sneak peek. From France comes Savage Nights, a controversial film about Jean, an HIV-positive filmmaker with two lovers, Laura, a passionate 17-year-old woman, and Sammy, a handsome, reckless man. Tu aimes les garçons? Tu crois? Je te demande, je sais pas. Arrange-toi. Je te violerai pas. Je trouverai bien quelqu'un d'autre. Tu trouveras personne. Personne qui t'aime autant que moi. Qu'est-ce que tu sais de l'amour, toi One best picture in France. Tragically, the director and star Cyril Collard died of AIDS just days before the awards ceremony. Another AIDS-related film, this one from Canada, is Zero Patience, the world's first AIDS movie musical. Victorian scientist Sir Richard Burton, somehow still alive today, decides to put together a museum exhibit on Patient Zero, the French-Canadian man originally blamed for spreading AIDS throughout North America. But you are my first gay ghost. Maybe I infected people. I didn't know. Incredible. The musical explores the myths and half-truths surrounding the spread of AIDS. Zero Patience also features a cameo by the late Michael Callan as Miss HIV. And from New Zealand comes Desperate Remedies, a visually stunning melodrama about two women lovers in the 19th century. But did he know it was urgent? Yes. And why him? I don't know. What have we got to go on in this situation? Chance? Intuition? Uh, the wonderful thing about costume melodrama, apart from allowing huge dresses <laughs> and wonderful wigs and all sorts of things like that, is that it, 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 it becomes a kind of metaphor also for disclosure and masking and unmasking. Remember, Dorothea, why we are doing this. I shall persuade him this very night. Personal integrity, uh, especially when dealing with the commerce of love, would be the theme. It's a gamble, certainly. At least it's we who hold the cards. Unless he be a wild card. Conventional wisdom in the film business says that independent films, particularly those with gay themes, don't do well at the box office. 
Let's shoot that one down right now. According to Variety, The Wedding Banquet was the most profitable film last year. It cost less than $2 million and made back 20 times that much. That's a better profit ratio than Jurassic Park. Catherine? Thanks, Sheridan. It's not Davis, Crocker, or Boop. The hot Betty these days is a self-described trio of diva rock stars. Their concerts always begin with the mandatory Hello Betty greeting from their fans. And right now, we're going to do the same. Hi, we're Betty. Hi, Betty. Hi, Betty. Not, bad. not bad. Not bad, but you really have something to learn, those of you who are not in the know, winky winky. We're going to teach it to you right away. Here's what happens. When we say, hi, we're Betty, that's your cue to scream back at us, hello, Betty. With a lot of enthusiasm. And a lot of love. Okay? <laughs> Don't be nervous. Here comes your cue. Hi, we're Betty. <laughs> Betty was the name of my first bike, oh, or my sled. I can't really remember which, whether I grew up in Montana or Florida. Well, listen, if you really want to know what Betty is, oh. Betty is the perfect, all-encompassing, all-American gal. From Betty Cooper to Betty Crocker, Betty Grable, all the great Bettys. That's what we stand for. But more than that, Betty is bodacious. Mm, sure. Betty is bawdy. Mm. Betty is brilliant on the, on the beat. Mm. Dare I just interject? Dare. And nobody, please, ever ask us, where did we get the name again? When the three of us got together in the first place, and we were three angry young women, and we got together in an all-female band called Quiver. And then we went to more of an art rock band. And then finally we got rid of everybody else and <laughs> bore down to the essentials. And that is where Betty came from. When something happens that causes other things to happen, and each of these cause still more things to happen, these happenings are events in a chain reaction. How do we come up with things? If your ball rolls, I mean, there's a, a big loving relationship here. Beautiful. We're fast, fast, furious friends. But um, but we're gals on the go, and gals on the go are gonna get uh, excuse caught up me. sometimes. Excuse me. What I was about to say was that when you're in a kind of compromising brilliant state i.e. the writing of things there's bound to be a couple of uh, tensions Gertrude said Alice Our new CD single is called Kiss My Sticky. That name again? <laughs> Kiss My Sticky. We're really excited about it because it's more than just a single. It's a single backed with an acapella song. It's a dance song with an acapella song, but we also have a couple extraneous extra mixes, and it's really, really fun and so inexpensive you wouldn't believe. We Great. think that you'll feel a lot better about yourselves as people if you have as much Betty merchandise as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it just makes you feel good inside. You and, are so uh, warm and giving. Mm -hmm. God, you're such a nice person. Thanks. Deep down. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> okay. Cut! Ooh, hello, Betty. Nice! Oh, hello, hello, Betty. Aye, 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 Why are we popular in the gay community? Why? That's a very good question. When anybody asks us, us who's gay in the group, we always say one thing. Betty is about magic. We like to be a little bit of everything for a little bit of everybody. In other words, there's one of each. Mm -hmm. If you can't guess, a brother. It's not really a big secret. <laughs> Kel Surprise. Hey, everybody out there. That's Bye Bye from Betty. Thanks for watching. <laughs> bye bye. Eat some brownies. Go on, chocolate. Go to the refrigerator. Make it's fun. Love. It's fun. Go on, go yeah, eat a little something. Make love. Open the refrigerator. It's fun. Cut! <laughs> Betty will be coming soon to your local Cineplex in a movie called It's Pat, starring the industrial strength androgynous one herself, or is it himself, Pat from Saturday Night Live. And now, here's what's coming up next time out. In the Five. United We Stand, it was a banner year for gay and lesbian rallies. From gays in the military to bridal waves in Hawaii, a year of historic headlines. And music's in the air, out entertainers scale new heights of mainstream pop.
And remember, we enjoy hearing from you, so use the 800 number at the end of this program to lend your ideas and your support. MTV won a GLAAD Media Award for their promotion of out artists. We leave you now with a video of two such artists, Elton John and RuPaul. So thanks for joining us. See you next time on In the Life. This program is funded in part by the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation and In the Life members nationwide.